Okay, welcome uh, back to the second day of the symposium. Um, just before I introduce uh, Professor Kumar, um, I'd like to remind you of the poster session uh, over lunch today from noon through 2 p.m. in the NCSA lobby. So we'll have lunch and also the poster session. Um, we have uh, five more talks today that we're excited about. Um, and after the talks conclude, we have a panel discussion from 4.30 to 5.30, uh, again in this room. Um, and we'll hopefully you know, integrate the different things we've heard and discuss the common challenges, uh, network systems. Um, then following the uh, uh, panel discussion, we'll have an informal uh, happy hour for anyone who's interested. Uh, we'll kind of go over to somewhere on campus town uh, I think the plan is to go to Murphy's. Um, so if anyone's interested in joining us, uh, you're more than welcome. Um, so I think that's it as far as uh, program notes. So without uh, further ado, I'll introduce uh, Professor Kumar, who really needs no introduction uh, here at the University of Illinois. Um, from uh, 1985 through uh, 2011, last year he was a professor here in electrical uh, and computer engineering and in CSL. Um, He's now uh, moved on to Texas A&M University, where he's the College of Engineering Chair in Computer Engineering. Um, he's worked on a variety of interesting topics, uh, game theory, adaptive control, uh, neural nets, um, huge number of things. Um, he's a member of the US National Academy of Engineering um, and has received a variety of awards, uh, too many to mention. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Kumar, who's going to talk about challenges in cyber-physical systems. Thank you very much. Okay, it's always a pleasure to be back. Uh, so I'm going to talk of uh, cyber-physical systems, and most of the people here are from this building, were from this building, except uh, I think Derek Cavanaugh was from Berkeley. Okay. But, all right, so uh, first question is what are cyber-physical systems? I think all of you already know this question, but I want to give you a historical context. Okay. So uh, one path to cyber-physical systems is from real-time and hybrid systems. And in fact, that's how the name was coined. So we all know that computers were originally developed to do computation, right? To do calculations, ballistic calculations, in fact. Uh, but then uh, in 1973, something funny happened. The field of real-time computation was born. And that's very strange, because if all you're interested in is doing calculations, then you shouldn't care about time. As long as you do A before B before C before D, the calculation will be correct. It's just an order thing, right? So the only reason people were interested in real-time computation was they were thinking of hooking up computers to the physical world, because it's only the physical world that has a notion of time. So already people were thinking of uh, computers interfacing with the physical world. Uh, and then, of course, uh, that theme uh, continued uh, being developed. And in, in the 1990s, for example, there was a lot of interest in hybrid systems, uh, which are the interplay of uh, of uh, logical dynamics governing, say, computers, and uh, Newtonian sort of differential equations governing uh, the physical world, okay? And then around 2006, a bunch of people, a uh, bunch of academics, uh, started uh, seriously thinking about how, how to extract more money from NSF, which is, a, <laughs> which is a permanent occupation of most faculty, all right? And uh, they came up with this notion of a uh, theme, galvanizing phrase of cyber-physical systems. And actually that has found traction because there have been uh, cyber-physical cent system centers established uh, all over the world, in Sweden, in India, in several places, okay? And uh, uh, also it has uh, become a huge component of the NSF engineering program. So it, it found some resonance. Okay, Th that's one path, okay, that's how this phrase came about. Uh, but there's another way to think about it, and that is you can think of it as uh, starting with, say, the communication uh, world. We are very much in the cellular world, right? 
and uh, we may be on the cusp of a world of wireless networks. networks. Uh, but wireless networks can only transport information. I can read your email, you can read my email, I can look at your web page, you can look at my web page. Just uh, transfer information back and forth. We don't do anything. In order to do something, you need to sense. And these are these modes that came out of Berkeley. You could connect your favorite sensor there. And these things can do communication, computation, and sensing. But uh, as we all know, sensing is just one half of the story. Uh, the moment you send something, you want to take some action. So you have sensing and actuation, which is control. And that leads to all these network embedded control systems and so on. So that is basically what is happening is this convergence of communication, computation, and control that has been uh, accelerating uh, in the past decade. It's interesting, the, these fields actually were born together in the middle of the 20th century. Then they kind of diverged. But then again, they are converging back. Okay, so it's actually a reconvergence. There's another way to think about it historically, and that is uh, in the modern electronic era, uh, you can think of the first generation of control as analog control. And the technology for analog control was uh, <coughs> the, <coughs> the operational amplifier. And that technology needed a theory to use. And the appropriate theory was frequency domain theory. So we had people like uh, Bode, Evans, Nyquist, and so on. Incidentally, Bode is from Urbana. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in 19, around 1960, uh, there, were, there came digital control. And of course, the technology that motivated that was digital computers. And they needed a different theory. It's not the frequency domain theory. They needed a more state space uh, approach. And uh, I happen to think that uh, it's, it's the technology that drove the research in the sense that this frequency domain was no more appropriate in this world of digital computers. You need a notion of state. And so Kalman, Pontryag, and all these people rose to the challenge. Okay? Uh, and on the computer science side, you needed to support uh, uh, timely operations of the computer, and that was how real-time scheduling also came about. And uh, this second generation of digital control has had a very, very long run, a very long and very successful run. Uh, there been, there's been a fantastic uh, foundation of system theory uh, that was uh, started to be built around 1960, continuing for about 40, 40 years. And uh, these are not, uh, I mean, every one of these is not just uh, an adjective. It's, uh, there's actually hardcore books behind each of these things. Okay? But things have changed. Okay? Things have changed since 1960. Uh, we didn't have uh, embedded computers. Now 98, 99% of all computers are embedded. And that percentage is going to 100%. Okay? Uh, we didn't have wireless and wireline networks, which allow you to configure, easily configure large systems out in the field. <coughs> okay? uh, and then, of course, tremendous advances in uh, software from things like registers and so on to middleware. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the big success story in software has been mastering large, complex systems. Though there are tremendous things, challenges that remain, there has been also great uh, success. Okay? And so this uh, revolution of this computation, the networking, the software, is giving rise to a platform change, a platform revolution, just like we had a platform revolution when we, had, when we went from the operation amplifier to the digital computer. And any time there's a platform revolution, you need to re-examine both mechanisms and policies. And what do I mean by that? Mechanisms is how you do something. Policies is what do you do, OK? And I'll touch upon that in a second. And I think all of this is just in time to save us from ourselves, OK? In the sense that uh, uh, you know, the 21st century will be the age of large system building. As we begin to become aware of uh, resource limitations, uh, as we and at the same time, we are facing increasing demands from huge segments of the globe for services which people didn't demand in the past, like transportation, medical, et cetera. So we have to do more with greater awareness of resources. And the answer is uh, 
more efficient system building and more frugal usage of resources and so on. So, and the, these technologies of communication, computation, et cetera, sensing and so on, are exactly what are uh, needed to build these systems. So I think all of this is just in time. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so this cyber physical systems, it's interesting. This is the 100th anniversary of IEEE. Uh, actually, IEEE was formed from the union of AIEE and IRE, but it's 100 years old, okay? And uh, the proceedings had a, this uh, has uh, had a centennial issue, which just came out in May, and they chose uh, uh, 29 technologies in that uh, special issue, and alphabetically, <laughs> the first for cyber physical systems, okay? And uh, uh, so if you want, there is actually an article uh, that we wrote uh, that appeared in the, in the, in the May issue. And Kyungdae Kim, by the way, was uh, a student at CSL whose office was just a few doors from here in the lab. Okay. okay, mechanisms and policies. So mechanisms is how to implement something. Uh, policies are what? Uh, policies, for example, in control theory, it is c control law. Okay, that's policy. Uh, and there are challenges there, uh, as we'll see. We need to go from attention to microscopic things to more microscopic things. I'll talk about that. And mechanisms is we need to uh, fundamentally re-examine what are the appropriate abstractions and what is the right architecture uh, for these cyber-physical systems. And again, I'll say something about that. And interestingly enough, you need theory to support these mechanisms. Okay, so there are control systems within control systems, if you will, okay? All right, so there are several issues of interest, and uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, two things. Uh, so we see this uh, mechanism versus policy divide, but also we'll talk of uh, things which are components of this system building, and we'll also talk of the gestalt. That is, if you look at the whole thing, how do you reason about it, okay? So we'll look at components as well as the whole composition. Okay, so several, in the, in the direction of components, several issues like how do you provide delay guarantees? You know, so it's very interesting. One of the big themes in cyber physical systems is time. If you were just living in the computation world, time is irrelevant, okay? And similarly, when you start do, uh, using networks for cyber physical systems, you have to worry about delay. So delay, time, these are all fundamental to cyber physical. Uh, another uh, problem I'm going to touch upon is how to extract information rather than data you know, from a network, from a, say a sensor network. And then uh, this larger question of what are the appropriate abstractions and what is the appropriate architecture given that we're having a platform revolution, okay? And then if you want to think about the entire system, how can we guarantee that the entire system in its entirety will function properly? And last but not least, what is the right problem to work on? Okay. So there will be a little morality play there at the end. Okay, so this, uh, this whole area intersects many, many fields. Okay. And there are interesting uh, issues on all of these things, but I'm just going to touch upon just a few here today. Okay. All right, so the first topic I want to talk about is how to deliver packets on time. If you're going to start closing loops over networks, then you better close them on time, right? Delays, control systems are very sensitive to delay. Okay, so just to motivate you, the current internet has absolutely no guarantees. And this is uh, camouflaged by saying that it is best effort. Now best effort doesn't mean best at all. Best effort simply says I tried and it didn't work and I'm very sorry. Okay. And even when they do talk of any kind of guarantees like your cable company, they'll only talk of throughput. You get so many megabits per second. But they never talk about delay. So we are going to have to uh, talk not just of throughput but also delay. We have to take two steps. And uh, that's motivated by lots of uh, traffic with delay constraints, a voice over IP, interactive video, and of course cyber physical systems. So fundamental question, how do you support delay guarantees over an unreliable medium like wireless? And the emphasis here is on unreliable. So the challenge is this, what is the appropriate combination of soft and hard guarantees 
that a that you can deliver can you characterize it completely and that's what we'll do okay if you want to think of a motivating problem uh, it's in in vehicle networks so what do i mean by that so your current automobile has about uh, 60 or 70 microprocessors uh, it has about 100 it has about 100 sensors and about 100 switches and these things are connected by wires, wiring of the order of one kilometer, okay? And this is the way the wiring harness is actually made. It's extremely costly, uh, very complicated. Their automobile companies are very concerned about the weight because it assemble, that affects the assembly line. And then there are also mechanical failures, recalls, things like that, okay? So can we get rid of uh, all this wire and just put a base station in a car? And this is not just science fiction, there are actually groups uh, which are uh, studying these things, okay? So that's, that's uh, a problem. But of course, if you're gonna put a base station in a car, then you're gonna, you need guarantees, delay guarantees. Okay, so, so I want to talk of a new formulation and a theory for supporting delay guarantees over wireless networks. And uh, I do want to emphasize that it's not just a theory, the formulation also, the framework, and whether this framework is extensible, allows you to investigate a larger set of questions and so on. That's also important. Okay, so let me go back to 1973, when the field of real-time scheduling was born on this campus, about uh, just down a couple of buildings in the old uh, computer science building, okay? Uh, due to the work of uh, C.L. Lou, who was here, Lou and Leyland. And uh, let me tell you the canonical model in this uh, space. So you have this notion of tasks, okay? There are capital N tasks. And each task is a periodic sequence of jobs. So this is one task, and jobs of this task arrive tau N seconds apart, okay? That's the nth, little nth task. Now, for every job, there is a deadline, and the deadline is, is the end of the period. That is, or the beginning, or the arrival of the next job. So you need to finish this computation of this job before the next one comes, or else it's not interesting, okay? And uh, what people typically do is they profile these jobs. Actually, they, you develop an operating system which, uh, which eliminates as much of the non-determinism as possible due to caching and so on, okay? So you can do more predictable computations. And then they profile the jobs and determine a worst case execution time. So for example, if you start the job at this time, it'll get completed at this time, okay? Now in this trace, there are two jobs that we completed before their periods, but in the third period, we didn't complete the job. And then we say it's a deadline miss. And in the deterministic world of real-time scheduling, you want zero deadline misses. Every job has to be completed. There's nothing underlapped about this, okay? No probability involved. Okay, and Dewey Leyland came up with a very simple policy which is employed, implemented in all your cars and planes and everything universally. It's called the rate monotone scheduling policy. Very simple policy. It simply gives, it's a static priority policy which gives priority to tasks whose period is small. So, if, if your jobs arrive more frequently, you get higher priority. It's as simple as that, okay, static. And then what they showed is that if the CPU utilization is less than a certain number, which approaches about 70% as the number of tasks goes to infinity, then they can guarantee that all jobs will be completed prior to their deadlines, irrespective of task phase. So even if the phase of things, relative phase of different uh, task streams were different, you would still complete all jobs on time, guarantee, okay? Very simple policy and uh, static, so very easy to implement with a very simple guarantee and this has been widely um, implemented, okay? And they also proved some uh, maximality properties of that. Okay, now what we need to do is to kind of lift this theory to the world of networking, unreliable networking. And the challenge is that we're not in the simple deterministic world where you start a job, it gets done after a certain amount of time. It may or may not get done. So that brings up the whole question of how can you develop a theory of quality of service? And over the 
past uh, couple of decades, there have been lots and lots of papers uh, written on quality of service, but really with no punchline. Okay, uh, and what I'm going to show you is a way to formulate it where which seems to be promising. Okay. Okay. So here's the context. There's an access point in your car, which is serving your capital N clients. Okay. And uh, we'll assume, we'll start with a very simple model of uh, unreliability, a, a fading channel, which is a Bernoulli fading. So, so when the ac access point on every day, it can send one packet to one of the clients. Okay. It chooses a client and sends a packet. If it sends a packet to client two, it uh, is successful with probability P2 and it fails with probability 1 minus P2. That's a simple model. Okay. And these channels may have different qualities, so therefore their success probabilities are different. Okay. And we'll assume the time is slotted so that all packets are of the same length because that's when you can give guarantee. All right. And uh, we'll assume that all jobs, just like in the Lew and Leyland model, they arrive periodically, there's a period. Okay, we're going to assume there's a common period because in this particular context, the traffic is more controlled. Okay, so there's a period. And uh, for every uh, packet, there's a deadline, which is the end of that period. And in this particular trace, you de delivered a packet here, delivered a packet here, in this period, you didn't. So in th out of three periods, you delivered two packets. And I'm going to say that the throughput is two thirds. Okay, but this is not just ordinary throughput. This is the throughput of packets which respect a hard deadline. So, in other words, if this packet were delivered later, you wouldn't give it any credit. Okay. So, it is timely throughput. Okay. Now, let us suppose that each client comes and demands a certain timely throughput. So, this nth client says, "I want Q and packets per period." Okay, that's the requirement of that client. So then this problem is completely specified by just a few parameters. One, every client wants a certain throughput, QN. Every client has a certain quality of channel, PN. And there's a deadline, and there's a period, tau. And there's a whole bunch of clients, capital N clients. Binary question, can the access point support this or not? Yes or no? And we'll, we'll completely characterize it. OK, so if you want to think of it in a larger context, what we are developing is a theory that uh, cuts across several time scales. So at the lowest granularity, we have this notion of uh, uh, unreliable channel. So it's a slot level unreliability. In each slot, you send a packet, it makes it or doesn't. Okay. Then you have a more medium term notion of uh, uh, deadlines and, and uh, period. So packets arrive every so many slots. So that's a more medium term notion. And then uh, you have a uh, much longer term notion of throughput. That's kind of in a long term average sense. Okay? So these are the three things that we're trying to combine and give a precise guarantee. OK, uh, I'm going to skip this because I don't think people are interested that much in mechanisms. OK. Let me work out the theory. So what uh, we're going to uh, work through this characterization. So let me start with uh, building up the necessary condition. So there is this notion of uh, CPU utilization due to client N, right? What is it? Uh, client N requires so much percentage of the base station's at attention. Why is that? It wants Q and packets per period. But to deliver a, a packet takes one over PN slots on average, right? If PN is a half, you need to make two attempts to get a packet through. If it's one third, you need to make three attempts. So you need for each packet, you need to give one over P attempts. So this QN over PN is the number of attempts per period it needs to make. But each period consists of tau slots. So this is the percentage of slots that the client then needs. Common sense or queuing theory, the necessary condition is that the total utilization should be less than one. Is that sufficient? Answer is no. And the reason is there's a new phenomenon that comes up when you have deadlines, okay, which is not there in queuing theory. And this is the notion of enforced idleness. So there is no queuing. So for, let's take this case where there's an access point in two clients and the period is three. 
So a packet comes here to this client and a packet comes to this client at the beginning of this period. Any packets that came earlier were either delivered or dropped. There's no backlog that's carried over. So at the beginning of this period, there's just two packets in the system. Okay? Now let us suppose that uh, in the first slot, this access point attempts client one's packet and it's a success. You're lucky. Then there are no more packets from this client. Then you have to turn to the other client and you try it and let us see you're successful. Then there are no packets left in the system and that last slot necessarily has to be idle. Okay? So some enforced idleness. So the point is the access point cannot stay busy 100% of the time. There's a certain amount of time it has to take a furlough. Okay? All right. So you go back to the drawing board and you come up with a stronger necessary condition. You say the total utilization plus the unavoidable idleness when there are these capital N clients should be less than 1. Okay? Or equivalently, the total utilization should be less than 1 minus the unavoidable idle time. What is this unavoidable idle time? Very simple. It's, uh, it is this. Uh, you have the service times of the capital N clients which are geometrically distributed with the Bernoulli parameter Pn and then you have a period. If the service time of all the clients is less than the period, then the positive uh, residue of that is idle time and you look at the expected amount of idle time, divide that by the number of slots is the percentage of idle time. So this plus this should be less than or equal to 1. Okay? Clearly necessary. Is it sufficient? And this is where things get interesting. Even that is not sufficient. Okay? And to understand that, let's do an example. Okay? So let's go back and look at exactly the same example we had. We have an access point serving two clients and we have a period 3. Okay? Now let's, let's put some numbers. Let us suppose that the uh, success probability of client 1 is 50% and client 2 is also 50%. So both channels are 50% reliable. Both. Okay? And let us also suppose that uh, client 1 requires a throughput of 87.6% and client 2 requires a throughput of 45%. That's many that many packets per period. As I said, qu fundamental question, can this access point support these requirements, yes or no? Okay. All right, so we go back, we calculate the utilization due to client 1, it's this much, that's less than 1, that's good. The utilization due to client 2 is also this, less than 1, that's also good. And the total utilization is also less than 1, which is good, clearly necessary. But you have to go and calculate idle time, right? So what's the idle time? Idle time only happens when in two consecutive slots both attempts are successful, which happens with probability P1, P2, and then you get one out of three idle slots. So this is the percentage of idle time. And then you add up these two, that's less than one, so that also looks good. Okay? So things look fine, but actually they don't because you have to look into the fine structure of this. And so let's do one thing, let's throw away client one, client two, let's throw it away. Supposing all there was, was client one. Could this access point satisfy them? Yes or no? Okay, so the utilization of client one is this, less than one. But when you remove a client, the idle time, unavoidable idle time increases. The utilization decreases, but the idle time increases. How much does it increase? Well, let's calculate. So if you're successful in your very first slot, you'll get two idle slots. And if you fail in the first slot and are successful in the second, you get one. So this is the idle percentage. And this sum is greater than one. So it's impossible. So this access point cannot support that just, just client one if it were all alone. So it's impossible. Okay. All right. So we come go back to the drawing board and we say uh, we need to look not just at the whole thing. We need to look at all subsets. So every subset of client should be feasible. So a stronger necessary condition, the total utilization due to a subset plus the unavoidable idle time were that subset to be the only subset of clients. Okay? Should be less than one for all subsets. And why was it not enough to just look at the entire thing? Because this is monotone increasing in S, but this is monotone decreasing in S. And so the sum is not monotone in S, therefore you need to check at other S's. Okay. And theorem, 
that is necessary and sufficient. So any if so so this uh, so we have a complete uh, admission solution of the admission control problem so you have an access point and you want to support all these applications so you want to admit an application or not uh, how do you decide this is it you just check this condition if it's satisfied yes you can satisfy not out okay so it's calculation all right uh, but beyond that beyond admission control you also want to schedule these packets how after you've accepted all these things how do you schedule your access point in order to make everybody happy and it turns out that there's a universal simple and universal policy just like the Lou Leyland rate monotone policy and it's also almost a static policy okay? so this policy is based on the notion of debt okay? so what is debt debt is how much money I promised you, say $10, and how much I paid you, say $3, then the debt is seven, okay? So I promised QN packets per uh, QN, throughput of QN, but I may have actually delivered to you less, a lesser amount, and that is the throughput debt. And I'm just normalizing it, just, ig don't, just ignore this, we can get rid of this. So this is, this is the throughput debt. And what we're simply going to do is give higher priority to clients whom you owe more. Okay? So the way it executes is as follows. Supposing you have three clients and uh, the period is uh, whatever, six or seven here. And you calculate at the beginning of the period, you calculate the debts you owe to the three clients. So you owe a huge debt to this one, a lesser debt to this, an le even lesser debt to this. So then you work on this client, you send its packet, fails. Then you try again, maybe it's successful. Then you go to the next debt. You try that fails, fails, then successful. And then finally you turn to this client and you try it and it fails. Okay? So this is the way it executes. It's a very simple policy. All you need to do is calculate the debts at the beginning of the period, not dynamically continuously. Okay? And any set of clients that satisfies those complicated inequalities will be satisfied. If they're satisfiable, this policy will satisfy them. Okay? All right. And this is just the, the many, many extensions. I'm not going to uh, go over it. There are, you can do much more general channel models. You can do rate adaptation. You can have more general arrival processes, deadlines. You can do utility, utility maximization for throughput elastic traffic. You can do strategic behavior of clients where clients are lying and cheating and all these things. Uh, you can do broadcast where you talk not, not just to one person but many people but you don't get acknowledgments back. The elements of network coding and so on come in there, etc. Okay? All right, so that's, the, that's all I want to say about uh, this whole business of uh, closing loops over a network when, where you need to give uh, deadline guarantees because you're interested in things like control systems. Okay, let me move to a different topic, which is how do you extract information from network? And this also was done by two students who lived uh, up there, okay? Uh, Arvind Giridhar and uh, Hemant Kaushik. And Arvind is a very wealthy uh, uh, banker of sorts on Wall Street. Okay, he went at the right time to Goldman Sachs, and then he left it at the right time to do something else. And uh, Hemant Kaushik is now in Bangalore working for uh, IBM, IBM Research. Okay, so information processing, and uh, there's been a lot of work, but I'm just going to talk about very simple, uh, one of the first things we looked at. So, uh, so one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the themes is to go from data to networks, to, to information. So uh, I think a, a motivating context would be a sensor network. Let us say you have a sensor network out in the field, we have a whole bunch of sensors and they're recording, say, a temperature, okay? And let us say that there is some uh, base station or gateway or uh, fusion center or whatever that's uh, interested in some summary statistic of what's going on. For example, average temperature. So that gateway or uh, is, wants to know what is average temperature over this domain, but it's not interested in all the individual temperatures, okay? All right. So if there are n of them, it wants to know the average. Or in an alarm context, it may be interested in the maximum temperature. 
or even something simpler than maximum, it may only be interested in whether the maximum is greater than 100 degrees or not, which is a Boolean thing, just one bit. So gateway may only be interested in one bit of information, okay? But it has to obtain that from lots of other data. So how do you do, how do you develop a theory for that, okay? Now there has been effort uh, on this problem in the computer science, going back to uh, Andrew Yao, who created this theory of communication complexity, okay? Uh, but they did not uh, address the networking aspects of it, the unreliability aspects of it, things of that sort. So this problem needs to be re-examined, okay? And in fact, there is a special issue of uh, JSAC uh, that's going to be dedicated to this problem of uh, function computation over networks, okay? It's, it'll be appearing sometime next year. Okay, and, and also this is a good uh, uh, perspective to keep in mind. Since, uh, you know, your current internet, uh, the routers are very dumb. They, they, they don't look inside your packet ever, okay? They just do forwarding. They take a packet, they look at address and send it out. That's all they do, just forwarding. They never look inside your packet. But in a sensor network, uh, the sensor network may have been deployed for a specific purpose. So it could be application specific. And because of that, you may want to look inside the packet and see this temperature is too low, the fire department is not interested, so I'll drop it, okay? So it's making decisions on what to do with packets, incoming information. So it's taking in information, giving out information. So in the process, it can change packets, create packets, discard packets, whatever, right? In other words, they're doing computation. So what is a theory of uh, how to process information in networks? Now one approach is just to take all this information and just ship it over to a uh, uh, collection point, just send it over and then process it there. But that could be very expensive in terms of communication bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe you want the network itself to do computations continuously and just give relevant things. What's the appropriate theory? And it turns out that uh, just as a, uh, just to show you that there could be some interesting questions here, uh, what you do can depend on what you want to compute. And there could be dramatic differences in the architecture, the algorithms, everything. And I'm just uh, going to contrast the mean versus the max, okay? Mean temperature versus maximum temperature. In the case of the mean, it turns out that when you have a large network, and here you can do some asymptotics, okay? If you have a large random network, the maximum rate at which you can exfiltrate mean temperature readings out of a gateway is about one over log n. That's maximal computational throughput of a sensor network for this context, for this function. Under a certain model, okay? You change models, you can, uh, uh, but you won't buy much because you're already pretty efficient, okay? Uh, okay, and the architecture for that is the common sense architecture that every one of you would come up with which is you have your domain, you have your fusion center, you tessellate the domain into pieces, and in each uh, cell, uh, you add up the temperatures locally, and then you take the totals and you propagate them along an in tree rooted at the fusion point, okay? And it turns out this is an optimal architecture in the sense that uh, it balances the bottlenecking that takes place of gathering temperatures locally within a cell with the bottlenecking that takes place at the fusion center when you have a lot of people reporting to you. So everything is nicely done, and the interesting thing is that this is an upper as well as a lower bound, okay? So the interesting thing to show is that you cannot do better, okay? What information theory is called out of bounds, okay? But this is not completely information theoretic model. Okay, so what is very interesting about this uh, result is that it ignores the most fundamental thing that communication uh, systems are built around, which is the notion of uh, block coding. So in communication systems, you don't send one bit at a time, you gather a thousand bits together and you encode them and you send them out, right? This is sham. It turns out that here you don't buy anything by ignoring block coding, at least up to multiplicative counts. But if you're going to compute something like the max temperature, then it turns out that block coding is fundamentally useful in changing the order of the rate of order at which max can be computed. The interesting thing is that this can be done exponentially faster than this. It's log log, much more easier problem. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip that. 
something because I want to move on to other things. But in any case, we can build some kind of hierarchy uh, which says that uh, calculating mean is uh, tougher than max in a co-located network, but if you do spatial reuse, you can get an exponential speed up and so on. So this is a little bit like a theory of complexity in a very, very primitive uh, stage yet. Okay, There's a lot of interesting work that needs to be done. Okay. Uh, the next topic I want to move to is uh, a larger context, which is what are appropriate abstractions and what is an architecture for cyber-physical systems. And this again was done by uh, uh, Girish Baliga and uh, Scott Graham, whom I couldn't find a picture for, and Kyung De Kim, and they also had a lab <laughs> right over here. And uh, uh, so this falls within the context of uh, software engineering, if you will, and real-time systems, as we'll see. Okay, so I think, you know, once we, uh, any time you have a platform revolution, you're changing the fundamental platform, you need to re-examine everything. In particular, what is the architecture of the system? You know, once an architecture is pretty mature and people are confident that is the right thing, then you can get, uh, then the problem formulation itself uh, is not, is people are more confident about, okay? But in the initial stages, you have to think about the, the architecture itself before you get to finer issues, all right? So that's, uh, that's what I want to suggest. So in the case of the internet, we have this uh, nominal uh, seven layer hierarchy. And uh, there are good, several good things about it. One is it allows uh, specialization. So if you are a modulation person, you can work at this level. If you are a graph theorist, you work somewhere here, and so on. And you're guaranteed that if you work out all the interfaces, then when you put all your efforts together, the entire thing will by and large work. And that gives rise to this notion of plug and play. For example, over the course of time, we may have, it's plug and play not just uh, at the external level, but also internally in the sense that if you have a, a different idea for TCP, say Reno versus new Reno, then you just replace just that sliver, but you leave the rest of it unchanged because the interfaces are the same. So that plug and play at a decompositional level has allowed, has given this uh, architecture longevity. So even though there have been different ideas, every time you haven't had to completely redo the entire system, you've only needed to change a few things, okay? So, so in fact, there is a fundamental tension at one level between architecture and performance. The performance guys always want to have bust the architecture. They say, gee, you know, if I can just expose uh, TCP parameters to the MAC layer, I can do 20% better. They want to take shortcuts. But there could be another person saying, wait a second, if you expose uh, MAC parameters to some other layer, then maybe I'll do 12% better. <laughs> now who is correct? Which should you do? If you do both, you'll create a control loop, and that, as you all know, creates all kinds of dynamic instabilities and so on. Not to mention the fact that at the end of the day, you'll get a spaghetti code with no structure, which will be unmaintainable, unimprovable. So if somebody else has a better idea in the future, you have to take that whole spaghetti thing, throw it away, and come up with a new spaghetti. So that simply is not going to work. So the point is that architecture, maintaining the stability of this architecture and giving it longevity has allowed proliferation, phenomenal proliferation of the internet. That proliferation also has driven down prices per unit, per unit deployment cost. That also is performance. So you can think of architecture as giving long-term performance. So there is not really a fundamental tension, okay? That's why you need to worry about architecture. Uh, and uh, if you look at the computational world, you have this fundamental decomposition, which is von Norman's idea of uh, instructions at architecture or this uh, separation of hardware and software. So Intel need, and Microsoft can work separately. They don't need to talk to each other. They're guaranteed that as long as they conform to an abstraction of what the other side is doing, then the products will by and large work. Okay. Uh, by the way, there is no such von Neumann bridge for parallel computation. That is the reason why in the 1980s we had thinking machines in Boston building massively parallelization things. And back in 2012, we're still doing multi-core. The fundamental problem has remains, that is when you have this parallelization, you cannot neatly separate archi architecture and algorithms. 
All right, and so on. Uh, so, so we have this uh, complicated cyber-physical system where you have sensing, actuation, computation, communication, everything. What are the appropriate abstractions and what is the right architecture? Okay. And what is the goal? The goal is not to make the system 10% faster. That's not it. Okay. The goal is to cut down deployment, debug, installation time of this from one year to one day. I'm not interested in a little speed up. Because most of the time when these projects are over budget, over time, fail, it's uh, not because something was not fast enough, it was just that the system integration was too complicated, too many debugging errors, et cetera. Okay, for example, IBM uh, was entrusted with a huge uh, job of, I mean, was interested in the job of redoing the air traffic control system, computational platforms, and so on. Failure, <laughs> it just failed, <laughs> couldn't work it out. Okay. So, so what we are after is to enable rapid design and deployment, and the critical res resource is yours and my time, designer's time, and deployment time, debug time, and so on. And the way you do that is through standardized abstractions. And, you know, the last thing the software engineers want to do is write software. They want to reuse, <laughs> cut and paste. Everybody wants to cut and paste. So you want to do uh, reprogramming and so on. And all of this through standardized abstractions, hope, hopefully leading to proliferation of these cyber-physical systems. OK. I want to show you a movie. Can you hear? So you, so you get the idea. Uh, these are rather complicated applications to build because this collision avoidance has to be a low layer functionality that, that's going to work whether or not you're going to drive to school or to the grocery store or whatever, right? So there's a higher layer application and so on. So there's, even there's a very interesting architectural questions about how you build the application. But, but what I want to focus on is the architecture of the infrastructure. How do you build an infrastructure of cyber physical systems? just like this hardware software separation. So in the computer, this hardware software separation allows you to, doesn't care what kind of calculation you're doing, right? Once you have architecture, you can compute what you like, that's policy. Same thing, we want to build a common infrastructure on which you can run any control application. Okay, what, and you want to make something that's composable, uh, proliferation oriented, etc. Okay, so, so we have this lab here, or we had here, and. Uh, so you have these uh, cars running around on these plywood platforms, you have vision centers, you have all the image processing, et cetera, and then you also have all the layers of decision making from set point following to generation to tracking, planning, replanning, uh, including a wireless ad hoc network or ether network, and these cars controlled by dedicated radio frequency beams, which you can think of as virtual wires. So the complete closed loop system, and that's where you saw this movie. I'm going to skip all of this, okay. 
show you more sophisticated functionalities. This is an inverted pendulum, which I've skipped. But anyway, the architecture here I'm suggesting is an extension of the communication architecture. So in the communication architecture, right, we have, we build upon uh, more and more complex constructs, right, a link, a graph, pipe, etc. And I'm suggesting that we ought to think of a layer that facilitates system building. Because ultimately nobody's going to care about the network. It's people will care about what you can build with the network. Network is going to become part of the system. Okay, so, and that can be done by a real-time middleware. And uh, this, uh, this is a real-time middleware that we built. And the application layer can be a simple component architecture. We have a whole bunch of components, Kalman filter, trajectory planning, deadlock avoidance. So this is all the policy stuff. And these components may be executing on different uh, nodes, and they can even migrate around. And the middleware that manages all these uh, components, so does all the housekeeping, OK? Does all the orchestration. So you separate the mechanism from the policy, OK, uh, et cetera. I want to touch upon one larger thing, and then I want to give a question, a larger, pose a question. Uh, so, so we have this, uh, so when we build these complicated systems, our theories, so far our theories are very microscopic, you know, this is a control loop stable, very microscopic. But here, when we're building a traffic control system, we have to, guarantee that the cars are safe, they don't collide with each other, everybody makes it to their destination on time, and so on. And the, what we are talking about transcends a lot of layers. There's a discrete event, a mutual exclusion model of a traffic light, uh, there's a Newtonian dynamics of cars, there's real-time scheduling, there's vision. What is a cross-domain holistic theory that guarantees performance of these systems? That's the big challenge. Okay? And it turns out that if you don't formulate these things properly, they're either undecidable or doubly exponentially complex. So we have to find just the right loopholes which allow us to create theories which give tractable solutions and so on. Okay? And this is a handcrafted example of a theorem for a traffic control context. But as we build more complicated things, air traffic control or power systems or whatever, uh, one would like uh, uh, a theory. <laughs> of course, you'll do simulation but theories are always reassuring, okay, at least at the initial stage. And that's a big challenge. Okay, but I want to get to a larger context. So this, uh, uh, and there's a notion of intelligent intersections. So here is, uh, I think, if you live in the suburbs in Champaign, you have traffic lights which are completely useless, okay? Why? Because there's no traffic. And so at nights, there's nothing, but they keep going round and round. And so the question is, can we get rid of traffic lights? So cars just negotiate via packet exchanges, and, in, and they go through intersections, thereby lowering fuel consumption, traffic delays, greater safety, et cetera, okay? So we actually created an application supported reluctantly by Toyota, okay? Toyota gave us money, and they were not interested in us solving this problem. But this is a, uh, this is not a, just a, uh, simulation, this is a provable uh, scheme for automated intersection. So nobody waits for anybody. Now you may not want to drive in such a car, okay? <laughs> but it's guaranteed to be safe, okay? All right, so we think we've done fantastic thing, but let's take a step back and see is what did we do, okay? So here is an interesting graph which uh, Frank Kelly actually gave, presented in this very room, maybe 10 years ago, uh, ten, uh, oh, oh, six years ago, which actually comes from a paper in uh, transportation research, okay? And this graph, uh, uh, every community, every dot is a community, is a specific community, an African village, uh, Tokyo, Los Angeles, etc. And on the y-axis is the mean amount of time that people in that community spend to commute to work. And they're all clustered around one hour. And they're also stratified by GDP. So here are the poorer countries, here are the richer countries. But everywhere, people are spending roughly one hour a day to go to work. So somehow human beings have decided that one hour in a 24-hour day is the right amount of time to travel to work. And that seems to be technology independent, GDP independent, location independent. It's just a human thing, 
Okay? If, it's a, if it's indeed a human invariant, now if you make it easier to negotiate traffic lights, what will be the response? The response will be people will live further away. And so again, they can commute back and forth to one hour. Exactly that's happened in Los Angeles and any place. Okay? So, if, so now, when you take this invariant into consideration, maybe the notion of what is the right problem changes. Should you think of congestion pricing or maybe rewards or whatever, you need to reformulate this problem and not in this geeky technological context that all of us are prone to falling into. We need to think of the overall thing. And with that, I will stop. What is the right problem to solve? Given that we have all these technologies, what should we do? I think that's a very important question, especially for the next uh, generation, because we don't, we're not going to get two shots at this environmental problem, water resources problem, uh, et cetera. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>